that'll seem important. Well, it won't be squabbling over the Euro, will it? Or England getting knocked out of the football? Blair's baby? I don't think so. What people will remember is what's still there when we're not. Our architecture. The buildings we leave behind. Which is why I reckon we'll come out of it rather well. There's never been a year for British architecture like this one. New houses, new stations, new museums, new big wheels, new uh, thingamajigs. Britain in the year 2000 has gone building mad. And now you, yes you, are finally getting a say in it. Because you, yes you, are going to help us choose the building of the year. It's been the year of the dome, hasn't it? But not necessarily the year of the dome. Every year, the building selected as the best new building in Britain is awarded the Stirling Prize. This year, for the first time, your vote will count. Later on, I'll be telling you how to make your views felt by choosing and voting for the building of the year, and we'll visit some of the contenders. So if you're someone who likes looking up at the sky, or a traveller on the underground, amazed by what's down there. This year, we're going to want to hear from you. It isn't just the capital and the big cities that have caught this millennium building bug. The new British love of modern architecture has revealed itself in all sorts of places. I'm two hours north of Newcastle here, in the Kielder Forest in Northumberland. Let's be honest, who could ever have imagined coming across something like this somewhere like here. Britain really is changing, and there's the proof. Vader's helmet, a fresh addition to Britain's coastal defences, or perhaps a hide for bird watchers with exceptionally large binoculars. No, it's a lakeside shelter for ramblers and nature junkies, somewhere safe to sit and wait for the next ferry back to the rat race. The Kielder Belvedere, as it's called, is the smallest contender this year for the building of the year. But from many angles, it isn't clear where the Kielder Belvedere actually is. It's involved rather mysteriously in a gorgeous outdoor duet between the man-made and the natural, between the new and the old, between our artistry and nature's. The shelter for tired ramblers is the elusive handiwork of a fresh-faced architectural practice who call themselves the Soft Room. They're not really rural types, they're based in Soho, but they know a thing or two about looking good outdoors. It's kind of like putting on a pair of sunglasses or something. When you go inside the building, it becomes much warmer and much cosier. And when you close the door, you really are in a kind of very warm, yellow environment. It's a kind of very snug world. I think that the idea of uh, using a stainless steel in a, in a rural setting like we have here and you know, being able to draw on the qualities of the reflections and uh, the way that you can bring the sky into the surface quality of the materials, that, that was a very interesting part of the design for us. I think that some of the obvious solutions just wouldn't have been as delightful for people to look at. One of the beauties of it is that it changes with the sky and you can look at it from different angles and it basically has enough complexity in it that it pretty much covers all angles. It was a very small budget and it's a very isolated environment here. And I don't think anybody fully appreciated how difficult it was going to be to actually get this building to this place 
at the uh, kind of within the time scale and for the right amount of money. So what was the budget? It was £35,000. Well, that's very little, isn't it? Yeah, I think maybe too little. <laughs> I think that the kind of small public buildings that we have nowadays, like bus shelters, places to make phone calls, are very pragmatic. And it would be good to kind of, kind of take this as an example of how you can make them much more interesting and lively and fun. You need walking boots and a ferry ticket to visit the Kielder Belvedere if you're planning to vote for it. I also recommend a large bag of midge repellent. There's definitely something welcoming, an openness, a friendliness to much of Britain's new architecture. It's not that architects have grown less arrogant. There's no such thing as an unarrogant architect, but they are getting better at sharing. You will have heard of the London Eye, who hasn't? Otherwise known as the Millennium Wheel, it's the engineering marvel that couldn't quite make it to our millennial celebrations, but which everyone's been dying to ride on ever since. The Eye's popularity is perhaps surprising. You might have thought that welcoming the 21st century with a giant fairground ride would have been symbolically confusing, or even inappropriate. But the elegance and drama of this spectacular circle of white engineering have won round just about everyone. In less time than it takes to complete a revolution, the London Eye has become a much-loved landmark, a progressive monument to old-fashioned fun that stares across at the Houses of Parliament in an amusing spinning punter to spin doctor relationship. what a marvel of Flash Gordon engineering this is. I clambered into my glass pod gingerly for a sky-level meeting with the architect. How many feet are we above London now? I mean, we're... 550 feet. Oh, we're 550 <laughs> feet above London. You know, normally, I must say to you, I would be trembling with vertigo at this point, but I'm not. It does feel very safe. Now, you've put a lot of work into that, I presume. Yes, no, it is incredibly solid. I mean, we were up here in very, very strong winds back in, in January, and um, although you could hear the wind howling outside, you were, we were absolutely solid. I mean, that's mainly to do with the fact that we've got these tuned mass dampers, which are these tubes that you see on the outside of the wheel, which actually counteract any effect of the wind. When you're looking down on London from low-flying Concord height, feeling safe is as important as being safe. And the architects of the London Eye play clever and deliberate mind games with their punters to achieve this. Their pods are reassuringly rounded. The seats in the middle are no lower than you are, but they're there for you if you faint. The speed is geriatric, the floor encouragingly non-see-through. The only way to look is out and about, feeling free and great. There was nowhere in London previously with which you could appreciate the city as a whole and from a height, and that's really what it's about. And I think what it's done is allowed people to appreciate London in a completely different way, a bit like when we went to the moon. I think the most significant thing about that was when it was actually looking back at the Earth. And that was when sort of all, all ecological discussions really started, of seeing the Earth as a whole. And I think, you know, people started care, caring for it a bit more, and hopefully that will happen with London. I love the London Eye as much as the next middle-aged kid. But how exactly does this splendid roundel of spokes and pods qualify for the Stirling Prize? Is this a supreme example of groundbreaking British architecture, or is it a very big big wheel. What do you think? Can this really be the building of the year? With huge amounts of new leisure time to cater for in New Britain, 
New architecture has certainly had to get in touch with its playful side. The spinning punters of the London Eye, like the lost ramblers of the Kilda Forest, need a special architecture in which to avoid the working day their way. Cricket was once a leisure pursuit in the days when Britain was any good at it. But now that we're not, it's time to put in the work, to get on the front foot and strive for that better drive. In India or the West Indies, this can be achieved by playing regularly on the beach with your mates. But in Birmingham, acquiring cricketing excellence requires the ambitious rethinking of sporting architecture. Edgebaston Outdoors is a reserved building, quietly efficient, Dennis Amis-like. But the inside is blonde, angelic, Gower-esque a billowing expanse of air between bat and pad. Most indoor cricket centres that have been built are totally enclosed. You even need to put the lights on to clean the building, whereas here, 85% of the time, during the hours of use, we don't need to put any lights on in this building to use it or to clean it. The state-of-the-art indoor cricket facilities at Warwickshire Cricket Club in Birmingham have been shortlisted for the Sterling Prize because they've brought such formal crispness to the sweaty business of smacking leather with willow. We felt guilty filming here because if there's one thing British cricket needs at present, it's uninterrupted practice time. Getting rid of airy drives requires an airy architecture. Edgebaston indoors is strikingly white, the sports arena a science lab a human test zone, continuously searching for the perfect googly. In the old indoor school it was very enclosed, um, the lights weren't very good, they were getting old, and uh, visibility was very hard, but in here it's a lot better, it's a lot brighter, and obviously makes it easier to see the ball. You can take the nets, push them back, you can have an open game, you can field in practice, you, you can do whatever you want really, because the space is here. There's a bar upstairs, so that helps. <laughs> That's right lads, to beat the Australians you need to exercise those elbows. When we first floated the idea of integrating art into the building, and we took this at the idea to the client for the first time. Quite frankly, it was aft off the agenda. The club in particular were quite keen on having sort of representational work of heroic shots from famous cricketers. And of course that didn't appeal to the artists at all. And I think probably that the image that has been produced, which has all the ideas behind it of the building and is integrated into the building, even etched into the building, strikes the right balance between being accepted and having some, some sort of integrity with its ideas. Nothing has quite as much power to turn nowhere into somewhere as a celebrated modern building. Now I'm not saying that this charming corner of rural Wales is a nowhere. I wouldn't have the nerve to say that. But even the most hardened Welsh locals here in Llanarthny north of Llanechli, east of Llandilo, would obviously admit that this is not an area previously renowned for its contribution to cutting-edge architecture. This one spectacular building has changed that. Someone's described the new National Botanic Gardens of Wales as looking like the headquarters of a Bond villain. And it's true, the outside doesn't tell you much about the marvels lurking on the inside. But whereas Bond villains keep the exact whereabouts of their hideouts a secret, this is a new building designed by the ubiquitous Norman Foster that's determined to be noticed. Now, of course,
course, people will be coming to the great glass house for all sorts of floral reasons. To learn about Mediterranean horticulture, to pick up gardening tips and buy pictures of Charlie Dimmock. But the chief reason they'll be coming, in droves, is to see a remarkable construction, somewhere unlike anywhere else they've seen. A man-made landmark, a must-see destination, fashioned almost entirely from space-age glass, suspended in a filigree of weightless steel. This is easily the largest single-span glass building in Britain, and it covers the area of a good-sized football pitch. Every pane of glass took two weeks to make and especially hardened. The question you're dying to ask is how do they clean the windows? The answer is that the glass is tough enough to be walked across. It's very interesting to see such a big span of glass. Really. And very impressive, I think, because yeah. it is the largest, isn't it? It's not a carbuncle, is it? No. It, it blends in very, very nicely. It was breathtaking. I was speechless. It was beautiful. It follows the contours of the hill. And although it's a dome, it's slightly tilted to the south, as you can see. That gives us the maximum amount of sunshine, and it gives us these various rooms behind the northern lip, which allows the building to be very, very flexible. There is a computer brain in the building, which regulates the temperature. And the best way to regulate temperature is to obviously open the window when it gets too hot. However, the computer will judge which direction the wind is coming from and will always open the windows away from the direction of the wind. Otherwise, you would have a sail effect of the wind blowing into the building and trying to lift the roof, which of course never happens here. As you can see, the, the, the ribs of the building are mounted on uh, these very large ball bearing points and those allow the ribs to move slightly back and forth. If you had a totally rigid building here, the danger would be that if it came under any pressure, it would just break up. It's clearly a very iconic structure, and people are relating it to a particularly Welsh people, that here is, a, is this amazing building by one of the world's great architects sitting in the Welsh countryside, surrounded by farms. Uh, that's pretty symbolic about our relationship with nature. Uh, it's also symbolic on how to live more sustainably. So in a sense, the whole building is really an argument for a new way of living. Plants are fundamental to our survival as a species, and we need to know how to work with them. So this is about coexistence, this project. It's a new way of working with nature. And we have a very much approach, a preferred futures approach on site, where we look 100 years down the line. We are worried about the fact that 50% of all plant species will be gone in 100 years' time, that nearly 5,000 languages will be extinct by the end of the century. Here's a place where, by taking the longer view, we identify problems and we can work now to make sure those things don't come to happen. The Great Glass House is very determinedly eco-friendly. The whole thing is powered by what they call a biomass generator, tucked away at the back in an avant-garde garden shed. I had a good look at it. What it really is, is a parade of state-of-the-art wood-burning stoves running on unstate-of-the-art piles of wood. Powered by wood chips and rainwater, an 18th century idea given a striking 21st century form, the Great Glass House is a spectacular example of the traditional becoming the cutting edge. In that sense, it's a pointer to the future of all our buildings. I don't mean we'll all be living in greenhouses, but we will be living in smarter houses with eco-friendly ambitions. Flexible buildings that change and adapt. Deep in rural Wales, a building revolution is definitely stirring. The adverts are coming up. Here's a chance to sneak a look at the Channel 4 website, where the eco-friendly Sainsbury's at Greenwich is already one of the early Sterling Prize favourites. But is it yours? 
Sports lovers may wish to vote for the new rowing centre in London's East End. But get back for part two, because our search for the best British building of the year is taking us to Russia. This looks like Russia. It sounds like Russia. It has that unmistakable, diesel-y smell of Russia, but not all of it is Russia. Behind me, boasting a rather oriental and cheeky green dome, is the new British Embassy in Moscow, opened this February, but because it's technically on British soil, eligible for the Sterling Prize. It's perfectly possible that come November, the building judged to have been the best new British building of the year 2000 will be located deep in the heart of Russia, on the sweet banks of the river Moskva. The old British embassy was grand and conspicuous, a big player in the Cold War. Housed in a converted Moscow mansion built in pre-Bolshevik times, it stared across the river at the Kremlin in a pompous political face-off. The new embassy is, in fact, the first one specially built to be an embassy and doesn't really look old enough for the job yet, does it? The new kid on the block seems to be surrounded by grown-ups. Looming up on the horizon above is the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a huge statuesque slab of power architecture built by Stalin in the 1950s, an almost perfect example of the bullying and terrifying government building. The new British Embassy, on the other hand, has a much more subtle identity. It's so subtle that I've been staring at it for two days and still its essential character eludes me. It could be one of Moscow's fashionable new Novotels or a bijou modern apartment block for the city's gilded youth, of whom there are suddenly an awful lot. It could be some kind of inner city planetarium. What it doesn't look like is an embassy. You've got to design an embassy from scratch. Yeah. What were your first considerations? What was the first thing you decided upon? The modern embassy has to be a, a tool for the ambassador and his staff. It, it, it's a, it's a multifunctional building. And that's why, for an architect, it's, it's one of the most fascinating briefs. With so many jobs on its plate, the new Moscow Embassy has ended up as four interconnected buildings pretending to be one. Some bits are filled with elegant apartments where the staff live above the shop and amuse themselves. Another block is for the office work. While the exact function of the tower, topped by the cheeky green dome, is a closely guarded international secret. What's in that dome, by the way? It's a rather mysterious looking structure. I haven't the slightest idea. I promise you, I don't know what's in it. I really don't know what's in there, and I have never been up there. I'm delighted that it doesn't have the feel of a traditional embassy with all the paraphernalia, because that's off-putting to the public. I want Russians to come in here. I don't want them to feel intimidated by coming into this building. For years and years in the Cold War, embassies were off limits for them. They were sinister, dark, forbidden places. It is very good now that we are working in somewhere that is so contemporary as this, that shows we've modernized our country. We're trying to help in the process of modernizing Russia. That's the message we're sending and which the Russians are definitely keen to buy. The rubles are pouring into the new visa section. New style Britain requires new style ambassadorship. In the foyer of this ex-Cold War embassy, pictures of the Queen have been replaced by poppy Brit art and designer armchairs. The art that's elbowed out the traditional portraits of Her Majesty is surprisingly naughty. This Michael Craig Martin picture with the rifled filing cabinet, the torch for breaking in at night, the seemingly innocent interrogation chair is surely a painting about spying. 
Does the ambassador know about this? There's a very striking piece by Michael Craig Martin in the foyer when you walk in. Yes. But he's an artist who likes to leave meanings open-ended in mm. his art. The enigmatic side is so interesting, and that's one of the great things about art. Isn't it? it expands the imagination, takes you further into other thoughts and so on, and his does. And his is a, a piece which I've always enjoyed looking at. I think everybody kind of comes into this building and wow. While the newly liberated Russians queue for their British visas, they've been usefully supplied with outdoor poetry to read and can prepare to enter the new Britain by encountering Wordsworth, which I can't imagine being much use to them unless, of course, they're heading for the Lake District. The lottery millions poured into Britain's architectural renaissance haven't all gone into Grand Projet, the Lantern House in Ulverston in the Lake District is a petit projet that seems keener on old England than it does on New Britain. But it too couldn't have happened without Lottery Lolly. This building doesn't belong to a group called Welfare State, even though they own it. That's because Welfare State insists it belongs to all of us. Who are Welfare State? They're a boundary-stretching creative commune a many-sided collective of artistic ex-anarchists who are getting on a bit now and who've taken time out from fighting the system to apply for a lottery grant. Get it, and with it, build this serendipitous structure. Not all of which is new. There's a converted Victorian school lurking in there somewhere to which have been added towers and gateways and an all-round sense of higgledy piggledyness in their literature, Welfare State describe this as a center of global communication. And now they have the mast to prove it. I like the Lantern House for its English quirkiness. Someone's left their terracotta clogs on the stairs. The stairs themselves are Tuscan in tone. There are railway features. The entrance tiles greet you with flying bee-eaters. You didn't want to be modern, obviously, in the, in the aggressive modernist sense. Um, well, it was interesting that one of the architects uh, we did actually ask to make um, uh, a, a study for us came up with what I can only describe as a shoebox on legs, uh, which was entirely over that side over there, which blocked the sun out. And, and we said, well, we might be kind of rural people up here, but, you know, we know what the sun does. Eventually, we appointed Frank Roberts, who uh, uh, we liked him, A, because he could draw, B, because he knew the arts and crafts movement, C, because he designed churches. And it was interesting that we had somebody feisty. You've ended up with something that, rather surprisingly, has a kind of, for me, a kind of seaside look. <laughs> I think that's because Frank was brought up in Morecambe. Why do you like towers? Uh, well, because I've always been interested in fortress architecture and castles. Uh, I mean, I've toured, or well, dragged my family around most of the castles and fortresses of Europe, including Verdun and the Maginot Line. I'm particularly interested in, in that sort of thing. I like the picturesque, I like the dramatic. Isn't it slightly inappropriate, given that this is a building that is so determined to be welcoming and open? I mean, I don't know, fortress influences, I wouldn't have thought... Well, I don't there. think there's a lot of fortress influences. I think the fortress influence comes in the two towers, and alongside it is that bridge, which links you to this sort of squat tower, which is a very, very picturesque effect. It's in a northern tradition anyway. I mean, it's, it's cold outside, so it has to, you have to be protected from the weather. Where do you think Britain is at the moment in its architectural wars, as it were? We all know, remember, that there's been an awful lot of argument between traditionalism and modernism. Well, I think after the sort of um, putting down of the prince, uh, it's all gone back to where it was, really, and the modernists are in charge again. Um, I was very surprised to get on the... Uh, on the list of winners indeed, because it's just not the sort of thing that the, uh, the wiseacres in London usually think about. The folks behind the Lantern House have little faith in the modern. But hey, they made the shortlist. If you agree with them, vote for them.
This is the Avent breast pump, a contraption that's revolutionised the collection of mother's milk because it's unusually pleasurable to use and doesn't vacuum the milk out but gently persuades it to flow. On the strength of the breast pump's success, the Avent company has built itself a new factory that's made babies and architecture critics alike very happy. Rural Suffolk, a land of wheat and pubs, oak and thatch, famous for the size of its shire horses and not usually for its international manufacturing success stories. You haven't gone out of your way to fit in, well, clearly not. It's a big shiny glass building in a very green and historic and rural part of Britain. So we've gone an enormous distance to fit in with the local issues. But you still encountered a lot of opposition. Well, I think in this part of the world you get a lot of opposition for anything you do which is different and which is new. Well, it's constable country, isn't it? It is constable country and uh, a lot of people here felt that the size of the building, rather than any other issue, was what made it not suitable for constable country. But I don't think anybody was really questioning the aesthetics of the building. There's a, a nice gantry right down the middle, which it must be very good for you to, to, to walk up and down and spy on your workforce and well, keep, the them in, keep them in, in tow. Well, the gantry is there because of the services which run up and down the middle of the factory. So we had to have a gantry for access to those services and all the controls for all the ventilation and everything is, are accessed from that gantry. So it is a nice place to take visitors, and you can take visitors to see the overview of the factory without having to dodge and duck between machines and so on and so forth. There's a delightful constructive innocence to the Avent factory. Things whirl and flash and sparkle. Everything's helpfully colour-coded, and the architects have enjoyed their engineering in the way that young boys enjoy their Meccano sets. but certainly is a lot different to the, the, the normal architecture around this part of the world. The air is clean, you can feel it, that the air is clean in there and the light's good. You know, the sun streams through this window. Yeah, it's nice to have this window And that glows up through our area, it's wonderful. I like the fact that it's got a glass front and it allows obviously people to actually see into a factory, as most factories you, you drive past. That's one thing you don't see and that's in. Definitely sort of our generation, you know, a bit, bit above there, you know, excited that new things are happening and people aren't staying backdated, you know, and old factory, 60s, this factory, you know, it's new millennium, new, new thing, it's good to show off. Out with the old and the new. Mm -hmm. They're improving on nature, searching for the perfect teat in an endless cycle of selection and rejection. The babies of the world have an army of workers on their side. Well, it's such a refreshing change for some really high quality modern building to be built in this part of the world. And had it been built you know, somewhere in London, it wouldn't have achieved as, as, as much notice, as obviously, as it has done in this part of the world. Babies who grow up to be girl guides will enjoy the new Girl Guide Centre in Wimbledon, described on the Building of the Year website, while those at the other end of the human scale may prefer to stroll along the new promenade at Bridlington. They're all nominees for the building of the year. Visit them and vote. Docklands boom of the 80s, an awful lot of ugly buildings punctured the London skyline. With the biggest of them all also doubling as just about the ugliest. Canary Wharf, spectacular proof that you can be oversized and charmless and a threat to the aviation industry 
and have a nasty pointy top and still get built if it's money that's talking rather than taste. But that was then. Now, at last, some proper aesthetic consideration is being put into the shaping of Docklands. And in the monstrous shadow of Canary Wharf, a masterpiece of London architecture has been unveiled. You can't see much of it from here because most of its joys are underground. Canary Wharf Station. A mere extension to the Jubilee Line, but, damn it, so airy and soaring and downright uplifting that it's been described by visitor after visitor as an underground cathedral. Going underground, you expect your world to grow darker and close in on you. But with Norman Foster's underground Gothic, the opposite happens. We're trying to bring light deep down into the heart of the space, so you feel a contact with the outside, so you don't feel threatened. It's deep below ground. It's resisting enormous forces. This has to last a long time. 200 years has been suggested. We're trying, knowing that huge numbers of people have to pass from the pavement above and end up on a train. We're trying to make that as direct, as friendly, um, as obvious taking away as much dependence on signs and codes. Like everyone else, I avoid the underground because it's dark down there and dirty and it smells. But at Canary Wharf, there are people stepping off the trains just to visit the station. What we have here is a return to travel as an aesthetic voyage a serious experience in need of serious architecture. Someone's caring about the way their station looks. They're taking pride in their engineering feats. Great stations used to be like this, and it's one of the recurring ironies of today's best architecture that while looking so forcefully to the future, it's also harking back to a finer architectural past. In a way, this building here is almost like a rediscovery of a lost tradition because if you think of this country and its past you associate it with with really epic initiatives in infrastructure in railway construction in communication and that has been in a way rediscovered on this line There's a splendid absence of clutter at Canary Underground. That bloke who usually fills these sorts of spaces with signs and wall junk has been tracked down and locked away. Hallelujah. How refreshing to see architecture doing its job on its own, creating dramatic spaces and finding the best, the simplest way to lead you through them. There's no urge to throw yourself under a train on this splendid stretch of the Jubilee Line, and in any case, you can't. The architecture makes sure that that tedious underground vocalist who's always warning you to mind the gap is out of a job at Canary Wharf. Just look at it. been said by lots of people now that this place feels like a cathedral. Now, is that something that you actually intended in that case? If somebody says, you know, I come out into this space and whatever the word is religious or I feel good or I stop and look at it or it moves me in some way. I remember at the time that, of the opening for the Queen of Stansted Airport and a policeman who'd been as it were standing on security duty said, came up and said, you know, I've been doing this all my life and this is the first time it's ever occurred to me that a building could be beautiful. Would I vote for this or not? I must say I'm tempted. What about you?
The city has been getting most of New Britain's new architectural attention, but the countryside needs it just as keenly. It seems as if the only time our architects focus as progressively on Britain's rural fabric as they do on the urban fabric is when the rural fabric in question is at the bottom of their own gardens. I've always wanted to build my own house since I was a very young boy. It's very easy just to be very indulgent when clients often are the people who really stop you going too far. And here you've got to be absolutely disciplined to make sure you don't do it yourself. So you always have to make sure you're meeting your own budget and always have to make sure you're satisfying the client's requirements, the family's requirements. Mr and Mrs Shuttleworth are not the only members of the happy family that lives in the astonishing Crescent House. Master and Miss Shuttleworth live there too and are ostentatiously named in the brief as co-clients. So what do you like about the house itself? Um, Come on, Jamie, think. Yeah, your mind's gone blank, hasn't it? I think as she likes more like the crescent shapes. I uh, don't know if it's unique or just extremely rare. Why didn't I think of that? Hmm? The uh, big open spaces in the house, like the living and play and kitchen area, even though the kitchen's not a good place for running about in. Especially as we spend a lot of our time just running up and down the living area. We felt we wanted to be together as a family during the day so we could all play, eat, work, work and watch television, cook together as a family. But also to have private spaces as well so we can actually go off into our own spaces where we need privacy. It's fantastic being put in the garden right into the house. Um, it just feels, you know, you're always living with nature so when it's raining you know it's raining, when it's snowing you know it's snowing. The grass comes right up to the glass wall. So you actually feel you in the garden. I think that's a fantastic feeling. Jamie and Joe are surely destined for world domination in whatever field they choose. They're full of smart, progressive solutions for architecture's future. Well, probably, well, hopefully, they might put solar panels on their roof so they could supply their own electricity, so a generator would be pretty important, a refrigerator and uh, other ways of conserving food. Mm. And just about all the other things which are we, we consider important in houses of today. The largest contender for the Sterling Prize is also the most talked about building of our times, let alone the year so far. You'll have your views on it, everybody does. Mine is that all the relentless fretting over the interior has led to a lack of appreciation of the exterior. With books, you shouldn't judge the contents by the cover. With domes, you shouldn't judge the cover by the contents. Why a dome? It's probably the most efficient way of doing a structure. It encloses the most space with the least material and it, because the section is the same on both sides, all the forces solve themselves uh, naturally. There's no, nothing which is sort of, you, everything can be repeated all the way around. So it's a very easy way of doing it. And of course, it's, it's, it's as old as, as time, practically. Well, curiously enough, it used to be one of those architectural forms that was loaded with a horrible traditional weight. You remember Prince Charles famously said, why can't we have more domes and columns at the height of the great architectural debate? But it's as if the dome has recently been freed of that baggage. It costs very, very little. It costs less than a sort of a standard shopping shed, shall we say. And at the same time, it has a very, I think, handsome shape. It encloses a vast amount of, uh, of, of space. And it looks very good from the outside because it has a very clear form. It's very legible. One of the extraordinary things about the success of Tate Modern 
or the success of this structure, the London Eye, is that basically they are profoundly progressive buildings or, or they're buildings with progressive ambitions and yet the public does like them after all. Yes, I think the public is, I've always argued, the public are much more open-minded than our critics, if I can say. You know, when we built Lloyd's, everybody said, ghastly, ghastly. The public flocked to see it. And when, when, the, in the, when there used to be a sort of a gallery in which they could visit, um, they had queues all around the building. The public are interested, they're, they're, they're inquisitive. The big difference in the last two years is that there's been a sudden change. I think the British, partly because suddenly they've seen what the quality of life is abroad, whether you go to Copenhagen or you go to Barcelona, you suddenly see the quality of life. They've brought this back and said, but we can have this. Is there a look that we have now that people are going to be able to look back on in the future and say, that's a 21st century early British building? No question. We're in one. Here we are. We're in this amazing combination of art, structure, space, this is it. There's not a better example than this, the London Eye, as a statement about the present at its edge going into the, into the future. What does architecture do? It shapes the world, that's what it does. Good architecture takes your breath away and makes places. Bad architecture ruins places. There'll always be both in our hasty world, but this year is particularly rich in the good variety. So go out and find some. The 50 buildings shortlisted for the Sterling Prize for the best new British building of the year 2000 are listed on the Channel 4 website. Look them up, visit them, and decide where your vote goes. Because this year, your vote is going to count. You can vote with a click of the mouse, or phone, or write. The details are coming up at the end of the programme. And there's even a chance to win a holiday for two in Bilbao, just for exercising your democratic architectural rights. So here are those details. For a booklet of the buildings and voting form, call 0900 or send an A4 stamped address envelope with two first-class stamps to Building of the Year vote, PO Box 23, Worksop Knots S80 1ZS. You can also visit the Channel 4 website. And one lucky voter will be selected at random to win a weekend trip for two to the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao.